Well, hello, Desert Springs Church family. It's so good to see you again. Let's go ahead and stand and worship our Rock of Ages. On Christ's solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God Rock of Ages will stand and the foundation to the end will never fade will God unchange the rock of ages you will stand When darkness seems to hide your face, rest on your unchanging grace. Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Great is your faithfulness, great is your love, O oh God. The rock of ages, you will stand. And the foundation to the end will never fail. the Lord this morning. Yeah. 
emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear is standing. Sinners was slain. So I cherish the old rugged crown till my true. will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary so I'll cherish the old rugged crown tell my trophies at last I lay down and I will clear Stained with blood so divine. Oh, a wondrous, oh, beauty, oh, I see. For it was on that old cross. Jesus suffered and died in pardon when sanctify me so I'll cherish the old
till my trophies at last I will cling to the old rugged crawl when exchanging someday. I will ever be true Oh, it's shame and reproach I gladly bless Then he'll call me someday to my home far away and his glory forever I'll share so I'll change Keep on clinging to that old rugged cross. We got another great one for you here. A one, a two, a three, a four. You are God of the heavens and God of the earth. You are God of our Savior's virgin birth. You are God of the cross and God of the head. You were God before man and God when he fell. You, you are, you are God. You are God in what seems like happenstance. You are God in every circumstance. You are God when we fall and God when we stand. You are God who holds us in your hand. You. You are, you 
are God. You are God, God, God. You, you are. You are God. You are God, God, God. Oh, you, you are. You are God. You are God, God, God. You. You are, you are God, you are God, God, God. Yeah, my God. All singing with us, church. You, you are, you are God, you are God, God, God. You, you are, you are God. You are God, 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 one more time. You, you are, you are God, you are God, God, God. You, you are, you are God, here we go. You are God, God, God. Yes, He is our God. Well, we got one more song to hopefully get you in the Christmas mood, and uh, please come on out for our Christmas Eve program on uh, Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock in the front of the church. So let's go ahead and stand and have, we have one more song for you. We have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing our joyous strain. Glory, oh, 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 in excelsis Deo. Glory, oh, 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 yeah. in excelsis Deo. Shepherds, why this jubilee, while your joyous strings were long? What the gladsome tidings be Which inspires your heavenly song Glory, oh, 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 In excelsis Deo Glory, oh, 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 Chelsea's day, Come to Bethlehem and see 
Him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended name. Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Happy holidays. God bless y'all. Take care. We'll see you next Sunday. Okay, thank you, worship team, and welcome to Sunday morning worship here in the desert on a rather brisk day. My name is Jim, pastor for senior adults and life groups here at the church. Pastor Mark asked me to pinch hit for him this morning. He's been doing a series, as you know, on the book of Revelation. He uh, stopped just to have a short uh, Christmas uh, series of messages and with some of our choirs and children's music here in the next few weeks. But today we're going to look at scripture that talks about how there will be a day. Uh, before we do that, just a couple of things to note as you are writing out your Christmas cards or beginning to do that or send some notes to family and friends. Uh, if you would like uh, to send a note or a Christmas card to one of our missionaries here at the church, we have a whole list of local and global missionaries. You can do that. Just uh, come on and we'll give you that list and you can do that this next week. Also, this is the week where we gather Christmas toys for the toy drive up at the 29 Palms Marine Base for the children. If you'd like to call ahead and come in and get a little card, it has the name of a boy or girl on it and their ages uh, to give a gift to. We're going to bring those up on uh, Thursday, I believe it is, the 17th. And if you could bring them in on the 16th, that would be fine. That would take care of that. So for today, I've noticed, maybe you have, in the last couple of weeks, how the Christmas decorations have uh, been going up a lot quicker this year. Normally, the big box stores start around July or August, uh, but usually in the neighborhood, it doesn't start till maybe the week or two after, Chris or after Thanksgiving. This year, it seems like it's gone up before Thanksgiving. And I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, well, what's the reason for that this year? It's almost like people are looking for the hope of Christmas. We just want to hold on to some normal life as things used to be. And uh, that's why things are, are seem to progress a lot quicker this year. We desire it this year more than ever. However, there will be a day. There will be a day. As you know, Mark's been doing the series in Revelation. I'd like to look at as we begin, uh, the start of this, this message is from Revelation 21. Not to steal Mark's thunder, but these are what things are going to look like in the future. Uh, chapter 21, Revelation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Can you imagine that? Earth as we know it will pass away, according to this verse. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. The city of Jerusalem, as we know it, will be a brand new city. Imagine that. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his peoples, and God himself shall be among them. You imagine God himself will be among us. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death, there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. All these things I've just described will pass away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. All things new. Can you imagine a day like that? Will there be no more tears? No more emotional drama which tends to cause the tears? No more death, no more loved ones that are dying. No more COVID, no, no, none of this virus is going around the world. No mourning, no loss or sad situations. No crying. Can you imagine no more crying babies? I mean, yes, there'll probably be babies, but they won't be crying. They'll be all happy and we love little babies, don't we? 
no more pain, no, no more shoulder you know, problems or, or knees or hips. Some of us have had surgeries recently. Uh, there'll be no more pain over those things. I'd like to read the words of a Jeremy Camp song. He says, I try to hold on to this world with everything I have, but I feel the weight of what it brings and the hurt. The many trials that seem to never end. His word declares this truth that we will enter in this rest with wonders anew. But I hold on to this hope and the promise that he brings that there will be a place with no more suffering. There will be a day with no more tears or no more pain or no more fears. There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more because we'll see Jesus face to face. Amen. He says, but until that day, we'll hold on to you always. So that's what we need to do. We need to hold on to Jesus and the promises in the future. Well, that's a day to meet Jesus in the future. But how about a day when Jesus came to meet us in the past? Or at least some of us. I want to read a couple of examples of that. Where Jesus came to meet with Mary. He came to meet with Abraham. And he came to meet with Zechariah. In Luke chapter 1, it talks about the story, a Christmas story. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. Starting in verse 26. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored of God. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and we call the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Amazing story. Where God spoke to Mary through an angel. And it says that God found favor with her. In verse 28, you were highly favored. In verse 30, you have found favor with well, to which I always ask some questions of Scripture as to what was the angel, how did the angel find favor with her? What, what's that all about? Well, according to this passage, we, we really don't know. We can just surmise that God gave her a heart and that God knew that she would be obedient. Notice in verse 38, she answered, she says, may your word to me be fulfilled. She didn't take time to think about it. She just responded, obediently. Kind of reminds me of this passage in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, which says this, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. I think as God looks throughout the earth, he looks for people whose heart is committed to him who are faithful and available and teachable, uh, willing to follow him and be a servant. Well, I think that's what God saw, and that's what the angel saw in Mary, one who's compliable to what God desires her to do. She was obedient. Well, does God speak to us today in our situation like he did to Mary? Well, I like the verses in John chapter 16 where he says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. 
He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. See, God wants to make things known to us through his spirit. And yes, God does speak to us through his word and through the spirit. The spirit will guide us into truth. He will disclose to us what God wants to tell us. Well, does God find favor with us? Well, like what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Some translations would say the word handiwork is workmanship. We are God's workmanship. You know, sometimes we kid about each other and say, well, that person's a real piece of work. Well, in a sense, God says the same thing to us, that we're a piece of work, that he's created in us some things to do. That's how he finds favor with us. We are created for good works. So God spoke to Mary. Then we also see that how God spoke to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, you want to follow along one through five. It says, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In verse four, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him and Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abraham was obedient as well. Now, as a 75-year-old person, uh, that must not have been easy. Most of us, when we get over 70, we dislike change. We want things the way they are, and that's why this pandemic is, is caused so much strife in, in our culture. We like things the way they used to be. Uh, Abraham was willing to leave all that and to be obedient to God. We don't know the time frame, but it seems like he responded just like that. When God told him to move, he moved. The angel spoke to Mary. The angel spoke to Abraham. Abraham was willing to believe in the unbelievable, that his name would be great and that he would be blessed to be a great nation. Now, I'm sure Abraham was thinking as he was married, he said, I don't even have a son. You know, maybe what I'd like to have is maybe a grandson or a great grandson, but, but not to have a great nation. That was just beyond his, his understanding, beyond his scope. The angel spoke to Mary. She said, yes. She believed in the impossible. The angel spoke to Abraham and he said, yes. He believed in the unbelievable. Well, the angel also spoke or God spoke to Zechariah. In Luke chapter one, verse 67, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prophesied and he said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeem them. So in chapter 1 of Luke, from 67 to 75, Zechariah just thanked God for what he's done in the past. Then we also see from verse 76 to 80, he blessed his son. He says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadows of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Well, who is this child? If you know the story, his name was John. We call him John the Baptist. Zechariah referred to his son as a prophet in verse 76, a preparer of the way, a peace giver in verse 79. He was a prophet. He was a preparer of the way. He was a peace giver. And you know, as, as John the Baptist in verse uh, of chapter uh, one of John one, 
verse 23 to 29. It says, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. And now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. I'm sure as he looked over the crowd, he says, he's, he's here amongst us, and you don't even know him. He's the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And this all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And then the very next day, verse 29, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, there he is, who takes away the sin of the world. John went, also, went on to say, I baptize with water, but he, referring to Jesus, would baptize with the Holy Spirit. God spoke to Zechariah. He spoke to Mary. He spoke to Abraham. And if we're willing to listen, God desires to speak to us today. So I ask you, who prepared the way for you to come to know Jesus. Maybe it was a family member, brother, sister, mom or dad, aunt or uncle. Maybe it's in your Christian education you had growing up as a child or in your youth. I know for me, when I was eight years old, I was in a Sunday school class in Omaha, Nebraska, in a church there. And this will date me by saying that the teacher, the, the class leader was putting little figures up on this board. They called it a flannel board. Remember those? A flannel graph. And I remember the, the picture of the uh, two roads, one going this way, a broad road, and one going this way, a narrow road. And she said, to really commit your life to Christ, you need to be willing to follow the narrow road. Well, as a little eight-year-old, I said to myself, I don't know if I want to do that. That sounds like a lot of commitment. I think I'd prefer to go the broader road of of just being religious, being a good little boy. So I sat there, and when she gave us the opportunity to raise our hands to come to know Jesus, I just kind of sat there thinking to myself, well, I'm, I must be a Christian. I've been coming to church with my parents, and uh, every Sunday we go to Sunday school, and we have prayer over our meals, and, and all, so I, I, this must not be for me. And I was sitting there next to my little buddy, Andy, and, and then she said, if you want to... Uh, after making that decision and raising your hand, go to a little room afterwards when we break, and uh, we'll tell you more about this. So I got up off to my chair and, and started to go down the hallway this way, and I looked and I turned and I saw Andy going down the other direction. He was going to talk more about Jesus. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I thought Andy was like me, and we were both Christians because we'd come to church. And, and by the way, we live in America, and that's what people are, right? We're all Christians. And... Uh, I never told Andy this, and I'll meet Andy in heaven someday, and I'll tell him how that really made an impact in me because I saw his life change, even as an eight-year-old, over the next several months. Well, then when I was about 12 years old, my parents took me. We, we were living in Cincinnati at the time, and they took me to Indianapolis, big city, to a big uh, auditorium where there was a speaker. He was an evangelist. His name was Graham, uh, Billy Graham, you know him. And he spoke, and I remember him saying, if you sense that there's someone standing at the door of your heart, that's the Lord Jesus. Open that door, invite him in. Well, I kind of got a little nervous. I felt like that's really what I want to do. I sense Jesus knocking at the door of my heart. But he said, you can come to the front and we'll talk to you. And, and uh, you know, as a 12-year-old, I didn't know if my parents would find me if I went way to the front. And it's a long walk from Indianapolis to Cincinnati, I thought, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get home and this is not going to be right. So I'm going to just sit here and, and I heard the message and that was it. Uh, then about a year or two later, uh, my parents brought me to a, a church service in Kentucky uh, where there was some Southern Baptist uh, preacher speaking and he talked about getting to know Jesus in your heart. And I really wanted to respond then. In fact, I, I got really emotional. I started crying. And my mom, bless her heart, she put her arm around my shoulder, and she says, well, that's okay, Jimmy, that's okay. And I told her later, Mom, you should have just kicked me out in the aisle and told me to talk to that preacher man, and, and uh, would have gotten things straight. Well, maybe 10 years later, 
I found myself at a, at a retreat center up in the mountains, in fact, not too far from here. It's called Forest Home. And I'd already graduated from high school. And by the way, I went to a Christian high school, a parochial high school, where we had uh, prayer in the morning and afternoon and over lunch, and we had chapel services every day. So I heard the message about the gospel. We sang some great hymns, and, and I have never forgotten that. But in my heart, I knew I was just playing a game. I was just going through the motions. I'd never really committed my life to Christ. Well, up at this conference center, up at Forest Home, I realized today's the day. There will be a day, and today was the day. Uh, I, I saw a difference in these college students. There were about 300 college students from around the West Coast. And I realized their lives were different than mine. They had a relationship with Christ that was very personal and meaningful. It was vibrant. I could see it. And I felt like that's what I want. I was selfish enough to say, I want that for me. So I remember standing up at the end of that week and, and going down to the little fire uh, pit there and, and taking a little stick and throw it in the fire. And I spoke before the 300 college students say, from this day forward, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. And I walked down the little pathway. There was a fellow there, the camp director. It was at dark. It was at night. And there was a little light there. And he had a little uh, book to sign. It was almost like for me, it was like signing the book of life. And and I remember I was so nervous, my hand was shaking, and I, it's probably still up in the library up there. But I knew at that point that my life was going to be different. I remember driving home thinking, there's something different. There's some motivation that's different in my heart than what was ever there. I used to have to work at trying to love and, and, and have a relationship with people. But this just came easy. It was like from the heart because God's spirit put it in my heart. Well, how about you? One of the things that I remember from those days is, what Jesus said, he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So I began to see that through when I was a child and youth, God was drawing me to himself to finally make that decision for him. Well, that's my challenge for you today. Yes, we hear that the, the day in the future uh, where there'll be no more tears and crying or pain or mourning, uh, there were some days in the past where God, through angels, spoke to people uh, like Mary and Zechariah and Abraham. Uh, but there will be a day today where God wants to speak to you. Let me encourage you to be aware of his voice, to listen to him, and then to do what he says to do. There will be a day where God wants you to speak to others, speak to them about Jesus. Speak to them in the form of a blessing like Zechariah did for his son. And it's okay to bless other people, to wish them well, and to wish them prosperity and success. There will be a day when we see Jesus. To finish with the words of Jeremy Camp, he says, I can't wait until that day where the very one I've lived for always will wipe away the sorrow that we faced. There will be a day with no more tears and no more pain, and no more fears. There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more. We'll see Jesus face to face. There will be a day when he'll wipe away the tears. Uh, let me encourage you to look for that day when God wants to speak to you as he did to Mary and Zechariah and Abraham. Be aware of his voice. Listen to him and do what he says. If you'd like to talk more about that, I'm willing to talk, Pastor Mark or I or Colin or Lorraine or any of us on staff and let's settle this as this Christmas season is approaching. Okay, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would continue to speak to us and show us what you want us to do, that we would be willing to listen, hear your voice and be obedient and responsive to that. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you safe. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace during this season. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. And we'll talk to you then.